I'm really excited to revisit Meenakshi's incredible journey. Planetary scientist and director and foundation professor at Arizona State University, Meenakshi was recently honored with the highest faculty award possible, the elite rank of regent's professor. This prestigious title will be officially conferred upon her in February 2024. Many congratulations Meenakshi, we are incredibly proud of you. Tune in to discover how Meenakshi navigated the path that led to this trailblazing journey. Hi Meenakshi, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. It's great to be here. <laughs> I'm going to start with something which is so fascinating. That is just so amazing in recognition of your contributions to have an asteroid name. So, tell us more about it and how did this whole thing happen and how do you feel about it? <laughs> no, it's uh, an incredible honor to have something like that. So, you know how asteroids get named is the person who discovers them has the privilege of naming them. And so the names are proposed to the International Astronomical Union by the discoverer and they provide a citation and and provide the reason why you know that asteroid should be named and then the international astronomical union has to approve that and so you know i was really lucky to have known jean and carolyn shoemaker very well respected planetary scientists jean shoemaker actually he really in a sense invented the field of planetary science and lunar geology in particular he was one of the original people who helped to train the NASA astronauts who went to the moon he was trained as a geologist and had hoped to himself be be an astronaut and be one of the first geologists to go to the moon but he had a medical condition that prevented him from doing that if you google gene shoemaker you'll see what an amazing amazing scientist he was and his wife carolyn was incredibly amazing as well they're both geologists and astronomers and they had this science program where they discover new bodies in the solar system there's a comet that's named after a uh, shoemaker levy comet that actually it impacted the planet jupiter in 1994 and so they helped to discover that comet along with uh, uh, another person who whose name last name was levy so shoemaker levy and i got to know jean and carolyn just you know through having attending conferences and getting to know them and they were wonderful they proposed my name for one of the asteroids that they discovered and uh it happened to be actually an asteroid that approaches very close to mars and that's sort of close to me because i you know i i obviously have spent a, a much of my career studying mars as well so <laughs> having an asteroid that approaches mars is is kind of a cool thing for me as well it was very kind of them to to do that and it's one of my favorite kind of little uh you know things that i just really enjoy knowing that there's there's an asteroid out there that's named after my family name of course that's what i like about it because my you know my dad and my family they are all <laughs> the bodwa name is is there So I, I know that they really get a kick out of it too. <laughs> of course. Yeah. And what about 8356 uh, Meenakshi? Yeah, so 8356 uh, when you discover an asteroid you have to give it a number relative to when they're discovered and uh, when they propose a name for it then you just add the name to the number. So 8356 was the original sort of designation for that asteroid. and then they added wadwa to that that's a beautiful gesture that's really special and congratulations to you for that actually oh thank you it was definitely special you know and, and it, because it meant so much to me because of their friendship as well yeah it's a special i was reading about it and i was you know so completely in awe of it so i was like this has to be the question i'm going to start the conversation with <laughs> <laughs> let's backtrack now a little bit manakshi and start with sharing a little bit about your role it's an untraditional profession scientist is one thing but to say planetary scientist and closer to mars i think it's important before we help people understand how inspiring your journey is that you share about your role yeah you know i 
growing up as a little kid, I had no idea what planetary scientist meant. I had no clue. And so I didn't even think this was a possibility as a career. And I just feel so lucky every day to be able to, you know, get up and work on work on things that are exciting and, and interesting most of the time, not all the time, right? I mean, there's, there's always some amount of drudgery involved in everything. So <laughs> at the current time, a professor at Arizona State University and I'm the director of the School of Earth and Space Exploration. And we have a number of my colleagues, I've got planetary scientists, I've got geoscientists, geochemists, geophysicists, astrochemists, astrophysicists, and some engineering as well in the school. I'm able to participate in missions. Over the past many years, I've been involved in NASA's Genesis mission, which was actually a return of some solar wind particles to understand the composition of the sun. That had nothing to do with Mars. Over the years, I've been very interested in planetary evolution, understanding what makes Earth different. You know, how why is it that Earth is so different from every other rocky planet in our solar system? Venus is next door, Mars is next door, and they're both within what we would think of as a habitable zone in our solar system, but they're very different worlds, right? I mean, Earth is habitable place. It's our home. It's where life thrives. We have an ocean. We have an atmosphere. We've got a place that's beautiful blue marble that really is our home. But then you look at Venus and (laughs) it's a hellscape, right? And Mars in a sense, also it's very cold and dry and there's no life on it at the current time and not that we know. And so what happened? I mean, so I, I was just to, to be able to ponder those kinds of questions, I mean, why is the evolution of our Earth so different from neighboring planets? And in my job for the moment, you know, I'm involved in uh, the Mars Sample Return Program as the lead scientist for that. And I'm hoping to be able to help to bring back the first sample return from another planet. And that's going to happen hopefully in a decade. I feel very fortunate to have the opportunity to be able to work on these kinds of questions, you know, big questions that we as human beings have, you know, are we alone in the solar system or in the universe? Was there life that ever arose on on Mars or any place else in our solar system? I mean, these are the kinds of questions that, you know, I hope that I can help to make some progress towards answering. You are saying big questions and I'm saying such bold and impossible questions, you know, and this forces me to backtrack and ask you what really influenced these kind of decisions, what allowed you to think so big and bold. That's really those are the questions which come to my mind. You know, I feel very lucky to have been raised in a family where education was very valued. Both my parents really were incredibly supportive for my sister and me. They never, ever expressed anything that was negative in the sense that, you know, because you're a girl, you cannot do something or there's some limitations that you need to be aware of. You know, there were no limitations. The sky was a limit, you know, in in terms of what, what you wanted to achieve, you could shoot for the stars. Everything was possible. Quite literally, yeah. (laughs) Yeah, and I'm so, so grateful to them. And, you know, as we grew up, both my sister and I, of course, we became aware of that society has has all these sort of so-called rules that are imposed, you know, unfairly many times on on women uh, more than men. And there's expectations of women that are different from men. And those are all sort of societal things that actually get imposed on us. But I mean, from within my family, I never had any kind of, you know, any kind of negativity or or any kind of, you know, negative expectations of, you know, you are lesser in some way or you can't achieve something. So I, I really give a lot of credit to my family and foremost, my parents. I read also a lot of times that your mother indulged your curiosity when you were all of eight years old. Yes. (laughs) So share with us that moment which allowed you to, you know, sort of stay inquisitive or what was that turning point? 
I think all kids are curious, right? They're always asking why, right? I mean, <laughs> you tell them something and then why, 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 why? I just remember my mother telling me one time when I came came back from school, I was probably about seven or eight years old. And we had been actually learning about human physiology and we breathe in oxygen and we we breathe out carbon dioxide and, and that oxygen is what sustains us. And so I, I just started to think, even though the earth is big and we've got this big atmosphere, there's got to be a finite amount of oxygen, right? Or if there's more and more human beings on earth and we're breathing in oxygen, breathing out carbon dioxide, there's going to be carbon dioxide building up in the atmosphere. And then at one point, there's going to be no more oxygen. <laughs> wow. <laughs> what are we going to do? And so I was like, I was super worried that I was, my mom you know, was like, what happened? Why are you so, why are you so worried? And so I told her about this and she was like, well, you know, actually there's an incredible thing called photosynthesis. And that was an amazing thing for me to learn about the natural cycles on our planet that keep things in balance. I just felt that, you know, there were answers to questions that I might have that could be found just from observing and studying the natural world. And so uh, there's answers to some of these questions about why we are on this planet and how we actually sustain life here. And so that's kind of what <laughs> what kind of sparked my curiosity about wanting to study the earth and the natural world. Let's uh, fast forward a little bit. You did your BSc in geology, right? Then from there to land up becoming a planetary scientist. So how did you traverse that journey and what sort of led you to that path? Yeah, so I, mean, I wasn't actually sure what geology really even was at, at the time. You know, I was a pre-engineering student and I wanted to actually go to architecture school. But there's some very stringent kind of cutoffs in, in your percentages where, you you know, if you miss it by a point, then you're not going to get in there. And so I actually missed sort of the uh, cutoff by a little bit for the architecture school. And so I had to think of other options. And actually, I was really glad that that, that happened. You know how, how life has a strange way of kind of operating. And so I, I had to think about what else is there that I really am interested in. And I... I liked geology because it allowed you to be outdoors. You know, the fieldwork was sounded really fascinating to me. It, it allowed me to understand the workings of our planet by applying the principles of physics and chemistry, which I loved. And so to me, it was not just sort of science for the sake of science, but science applied towards understanding something about our planet. That sounded really amazing to me. And that's how I ended up enrolling in the honor school, actually, in, in geology at Punjab University. And it was an interesting place, actually. I visited there, and I actually noticed that there were no women professors, and there were very, very few women students in the school, in that department. That was a little strange. You know, I, I hadn't realized that that was such a sort of skewed ratio of women to men in that school. And I talked to some of the professors, and and they really were not encouraging. I mean, they were like, well, maybe you should not consider coming here. You know, field work is hard. You're going to have a tough time. <laughs> so they really tried to dissuade me. But that only sort of served to kind of make me even like, why Why do they think I can't do that? <laughs> and I, I wanted to do it. So I was like, well, I don't really care. I'm going to do it, you know. Yeah, so I was in, in my class. There were only two of us girls and them were all boys so it was a class of 20 yeah but it was the path I chose so how did you then navigate those I'm guessing at least four years do you think it was like a turning point for the university to see that girls can do this no you know there were a few girls in that department it wasn't like there weren't any but there weren't many of us and so it was certainly not the chosen kind of some of the other departments, for example, zoology and botany. I mean, they, they had lots of women in those departments, but certainly not in geology. And yeah, I mean, you know, the field work, yes, you had to be outdoors and there was a little bit more physical work involved with hiking to do all the stuff. But I, I love doing that stuff. To me, it was just it was fun. I won't say it was not you know, it was not difficult or anything. I think there were challenges there, especially 
just with those kind of expectations of the professors and your peers also i mean i think thinking hey as a woman you're you're not going to be able to deal with this and those kinds of expectations are always imposed on you constantly and i i certainly felt the weight of that and so i decided to come to graduate school in the united states and i at the time i i kind of figured well maybe the balance of men and women is going to be better but as it turned out it was not better <laughs> it was also very male dominated but uh, things have changed you know just in the last several i guess two or three decades things have changed a lot it's still actually very much a male dominated field geology in general but also other areas like astrophysics and engineering the kinds of things that i do in my school but that's one of the things that i've really made a priority um as the director of the school to really try to make it a more equitable gender distribution certainly in our school now is you know closer to something like 35% of our faculty are women at this point which is a huge shift from even 10 years ago that's amazing are you intentional about bringing students and ensuring the gender ratios even in the students like finding ways to inspire and motivate more women or girls to come in those fields absolutely i mean i think that's where it starts right i mean that's the start of the pipeline and so by the time you know you get to the level of of a full professor then you know the numbers dwindle to smaller and smaller and smaller numbers right so the pipeline has to be robust to start out with and you've got to support them and for me the concern at this point it's just to make the sciences in general more accessible to women of course but i'm thinking not just you know the gender balance but also the racial disparities particularly geology programs and astrophysics programs the hard sciences so to speak are very dominated by white males we're doing a lot especially in our at our university and in my department the focus has been on trying to make it a more equitable a more diverse and more inclusive environment where we have a better gender balance but also a better balance of other types of diversity in the school as well uh minakshi so you did your post graduation and then you did your doctorate so was teaching the obvious path i didn't necessarily see teaching as the path what really was a driver for me was the questions right why is our planet the way it is why are we here where did we come from in our solar system the only planet where there is life so you can call them sort of philosophical questions in some way you know are we alone in the universe and what does it mean for us if there is other life in the universe we're not special in some way right i mean so these are very human questions and i think human beings have the unique capacity among all living things to to ask those kinds of questions and to be able to try to answer them right and so i started out actually after i got my phd i had a short stint as a postdoctoral researcher at university of california in san diego but then i got this a job as a curator at the field museum in chicago and i also had i was affiliated at the university of chicago and so i did a little bit of teaching but my main job you know at the university at the field museum was basically to do research there was of course a really kind of fun aspect to that was doing outreach and being involved in doing sort of exhibits designing exhibits for the public and doing public talks and things like that but big part of my job there was was my research in studying space rocks actually so basically looking at rocks from other places in our solar system and trying to understand something about the origin and evolution of the earth and other planets and so i was there for almost 11 years before i actually moved to arizona state to take up the job as a professor at asu and that obviously involved teaching as well as research and i love both that. and i think mentoring students is actually one of the real pleasures in my job now comes the exciting part like i read about so many missions you've done so which was your favorite mission 
take us through one of your missions and what were your experiences? So I mentioned the Genesis mission, which was to collect solar wind to understand the composition of the sun. I've been part of the Mars Science Laboratory mission. That's the Curiosity rover. That is actually still active on Mars. I'm also participating as a science team member on the Perseverance rover mission. So that is currently also exploring Mars right now and collecting samples, actually. But the mission that I'm most, I guess, excited about is uh, Mars Sample Return, where I'm participating as the principal scientist for that mission. And so the goal is to actually bring back the samples that are currently being collected by the Perseverance rover. And it's going to take a while, though, because... This is still in the planning and formulation. The plans for this mission are are taking place. And we're only just getting to a point where we're starting to build some hardware for it. There's going to be two launches and they're going to happen in 2027, 2028 timeframe. It's a complex mission because, you know, you have to have one launch that's going to be an orbiter around Mars. There's going to be another launch that's going to be a lander that's going to actually have the means to bring the samples to the lander and then launch the samples into orbit where they will then rendezvous with the orbiter. And then there's going to be a capsule, uh, an Earth entry system that's going to be bringing back the samples to Earth. And so it's a very complicated mission. Return of the samples is not before, I guess, 2033. So, you know, we're talking 10 years from now. So Minakshi, you, you know, before this, you said that it's a lot of fun, but there's also drudgery involved. Love to double click on that and share with us the realities of this completely fascinating (laughs) profession. (laughs) So, I mean, you know, well, to have a research program, you have to write proposals to funding agencies to support your research and to support your work. Any kind of sort of faculty position at a research university like where I am, and that's that's not a lot of fun, but you got to do it because that's what really kind of helps to support the students that are working with you and the postdoctoral researchers that are working with you. And so you have to sustain your research program. So, yeah, there's definitely fun parts of the job, but there's also sort of (laughs) parts of the job that really feel feel like work. And so, (laughs) yes. I mean, similarly, you know, for the teaching aspect, I love I love teaching and I love interacting with students, but there's always grading involved in some of the teaching, and, and that's not my favorite part. <laughs> but but I think all of us have to sort of suck it up and take the good with the bad, and the fun certainly far outweighs the drudgery. So that's why I'm doing what I'm doing. I read a little bit about the Iceland mission, so share with us that whole experience and my god it shows so much of strength and so much of perseverance so i think that lesson is so inspiring yeah that was that was now about uh five years ago i actually had a nasa project to study rocks from iceland lava flows actually the reason for studying them is that uh, they're good analogs for lava flows on mars And I wanted to select some samples from these lava flows and bring them back to my laboratory and do some analyses and make comparisons with what we might find on Mars and, you know, hope to somehow understand, of course, the geologic history and the history of water in particular on Mars. And so I had basically arranged to do some field work in Iceland. And so I was there in August of 2017 and a colleague at the University of Iceland who was the local uh, person knowledgeable about the field area and wanted to basically help us. And so he and I and, you know, his postdoctoral scholar, and I I actually had a friend of mine from the Phoenix area who's also a, a professor here at a local college. She came along with me just because she's interested in science communication and she wanted to take some images and pictures of the work her name is Cyan. This was probably maybe two days into our trip, and we were quite far away from any kind of big city. We were probably six or seven hours away from Reykjavik by car. We had stopped for lunch 
at a spot that actually was geologically very interesting. And so there were a number of other cars there as well that had stopped there. And we had started to, after lunch, you know, go back on the road. And my colleague who was driving the car, I was sitting in the back seat with my friend. And he basically started to overtake a, a caravan of cars that were on the side of the road. And he was accelerating when another car from the sort of lane adjacent to us moved into the same lane as us and it hit our car and our car overturned and it sort of rolled off. I actually am glad I don't remember it, but apparently I basically was ejected from the car and I was not wearing a seatbelt, which was not good because I, you know, we just started to move after lunch and I was taking some pictures outside the back window and I hadn't yet belted in. So yeah, so I was the only one in the car who actually was ejected from the vehicle. And and my friend, she literally, I think she remembers sort of after the car, car had rolled over about three times and it landed upside down, she sort of unstrapped herself and started looking around for me and she didn't see me and ran out looking for me. And I, I was probably 30 feet unconscious. And she was, of course, very worried because I certainly didn't look very good. I, I don't remember like anything from that. I compl- have complete sort of memory loss from that. And so basically, I remember though waking up kind of the next day in emergency room in Reykjavik. My friend had called my husband, who happened to be fortunately on the East Coast of the United States. And so he was able to take a flight over right away. But I had a tremendous amount of traumatic injuries. I had, you know, lots of broken bones, especially on my left side. My lung was punctured and uh, my sort of shoulder, scapula, my hip girdle was completely fractured. And so they had to basically evacuate me from uh, Iceland. That was a tough thing in itself because in the month of August, you know, everybody goes on vacation in, in Iceland. And all of, there was not a single orthopedic surgeon in the country when this happened. And so, so I was literally a, for a two or three days just waiting to be evacuated because there was really no nothing that they could do for me. So I was lucky though, because my husband, he was on the phone constantly for two days trying to get this worked out. And I was finally airlifted out to Boston and Mass General Hospital is where I was I had to have a lot of surgery and some amount of recovery there. And then I was shifted to another hospital in Houston where I I did a lot of rehab and I was in a wheelchair for about four months and had lots of physical therapy for the year after that. But yeah, it was, it was definitely a very bizarre incident. Of course, it took about a good year and a half to recover, but you know, I'm so lucky that I actually had incredible care. I had access to great surgeons who were able to do a lot of really fantastic surgery on me that, that basically I'm, I'm a I'm bionic woman at this point. So I've got lots of, lots, <laughs> lots of metal supporting my bone structure. And of course, I mean, my husband, he basically sustained me through this whole period when I really couldn't do anything for myself. And my sister, of course, she was in Austin at the time. And so she spent, came and spent some time with me and helped us a lot. And yeah, it was a long road. To recovery, but I've done a couple of half marathons since that time, and I've hiked in into the Grand Canyon and back out, uh, you know, down to the river and back up to the rim. So it's yeah, I'm well recovered and doing well. Wow, my God, I'm getting goosebumps even listening to it, Manakshi. <laughs> Kudos to you and Team Manakshi, which has sort of helped this turn around. Yeah, <laughs> but you know, it was one of those things that really helped me to sort of, again, just see the things that are important in life. Sometimes you need a reminder like that, to remind you of, of what's really important. And, you know, you know who your real friends are, you know, at a time like that. And certainly the kind of support that you get from your family, you can't really get anywhere else. And so it makes you think about what you want to do in life and what kind of impact you want to have. That was part of the reason why I I decided to take part in a leadership training uh, to try to do the kinds of things I'm hoping to be able to do now as as director of a school and try to make 
education and science more accessible and more available to a lot more people, especially for women and for minorities here in the United States. I mean, there is a lot of disparity, especially in the sciences and in STEM fields. There's not a lot of women. You know, there's lots of disparity in terms of people of color and, and Black and Indigenous students, right? It's a very inequitable distribution among the different populations. It really made me kind of realize I wanted to try to do more to sort of make it a more even playing field, make education and careers in, in science more accessible to many more people than, than it has been. Menakshi, I can see that you're really passionate about bringing equity in education and making it more accessible. So I'm wondering any anecdotes, any sort of stories which really triggered this drive in you or this, you know, this why? I think it comes from my own personal experience in many ways. I mean, I, I was one of very few women in my class in India, of course. But when I came to the United States, it was the situation was not that much different, right? I was the only woman, and I was certainly the only woman of color <laughs> in my class. And so I just felt like, why is it that other people like me don't have that opportunity? And why is it so dominated by a, a certain sector of our population? And what would it take to have this be more accessible to others as well? And so as a young scientist in the field, I I certainly kind of experienced gender discrimination in terms of, you know, people always underestimating what you could do and always wrong about things. But, you know, nevertheless, it kind of held you back, right, in some situations, certainly. And so I have been there firsthand and I know how disruptive it can be. And there's so much science at this point that shows the outcomes are so much better in academia and in industry if you have, you know, diverse perspective around the table, right? Absolutely, yeah. But I've, I've been very lucky over overall. As I said, my parents were always supportive. They never wavered in their support. My family's always been there for me. But the professional career, that's not always been easy, but, you know, I felt generally very supported. And so I feel very lucky and I've wanted to sort of extend that privilege to others as well. For example, when I first joined the Field Museum, I was actually the very first woman to be part of their Department of Geology. And I found out, you know, I still remember <laughs> that as a, a young sort of a faculty member in the department, when I had to sort of uh, make decisions about allocating samples from our collection at the Field Museum to researchers, I always had to get sort of approval signature from my department chair. And I thought that was just sort of gen, you know general process. Everybody had to do that. And then over maybe you know three or four years that I was there, I discovered that other faculty members in my department, some of whom actually were more junior than I was, were just kind of allowed to make the decisions on their own without having the department chair kind of overseeing that process and approving it, right? Oh, gosh, that, that made me so mad. <laughs> you know, I still remember kind of realizing that. And I just remember storming into my department chair's office and saying, I'm not going to be asking for your approval anymore. <laughs> so what gave you that confidence and uh, sort of drive to just walk in and call him out? <laughs> no, I mean, you put up with little microaggressions, you know, we all have sort of heard that term microaggressions, right? I mean, at this point, but this is something that as women, you know, we're familiar with this. There's like little cuts all the time. There's like little snide comments or remarks or whatever it is that are always sort of hitting you constantly. And then something happens that really kind of, you know, is a straw that kind of breaks the camel's back in a sense. And that's basically what, what this was. I mean, I, you know, I kind of felt like, you know, there were always times things like if you're in a meeting, sitting around a table at a faculty meeting and, you know, you say something and, you know, people will generally kind of maybe ignore you or whatever it is. And, and that would happen a number of times, especially as the lone woman in a department like that. And then some of the male professor would say something about the similar thing and, and they would be like, oh, yeah, yeah, let's go with that idea. And like, I just said that. But, <laughs> you know, you kind of feel ignored uh, and sidelined in many ways. And 
again, just sort of overall just being underestimated, you know, all the time. And you get used to it after a point, but you also sort of build up a little bit of resentment and anger as you sort of more as more and more piles up. And then at a certain point, you do sort of reach a breaking point where it's just like, I don't care what the outcome of this is, but I'm going to have my say, you know? <laughs> so uh, yeah, you know, I'd reached that point by that point. Uh, I was like, well, I'm not going to be treated differently from my other colleagues. And so this is how it's going to work. You know, <laughs> It's almost like it can't get any worse. Like at the most, what will happen? At the most, what will happen? Exactly. And, uh, you know, at the time, of course, there were sort of obviously rules against discrimination, right? But you don't want to be heavy handed about it and say, I'm going to bring a complaint against you or something like that. But that would have would have been a a valid complaint. So anyway, I knew I was in the right. And that gave me the courage to actually speak up. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. I really appreciate you sharing this, Minakshi. Minakshi, you've spoken a lot about, you know, mentorship and the fact that you're very intentional about it in your role as a director at ASU. Talk to me about mentors in your journey thus far. Yeah, that is such an important question, actually, because, you know, none of us really get to where we are without having people that really are, in a sense, our guardian angels. My guardian angel was my PhD advisor. Actually, her name's Galen Crozaz, and she is retired at this point. She lives in Belgium. She's actually Belgian to start with, but she had been in the United States at Washington University in St. Louis, which is where I went to graduate school. I feel incredibly lucky because she's one of the few women professors in that department. And I actually, when I first wrote to her, I thought she was a man. So I was like, dear sir, you know, <laughs> and, then, and she wrote back oh, and I could almost hear the laughter in her, her response because she's like, uh, please don't call me, sir. I'm you know, a woman. <laughs> so, it's not the internet days when you could go and Google a picture no, and see I, what the person is. <laughs> exactly. So I had, I never sort of heard her, you know, type of name before, you know, Gillen. Crozaz, I have no idea whether that was a man or a woman, but I just made the assumption, of course, given, you know, our environment and, and what I'd seen, of course, in my department at Punjab University, I was like, oh my God, it's actually a woman. I was lucky because not very many women in my generation had women mentors. And she was amazing. I mean, she was just, she really made it so much easier for me, you know, just the path as a woman, you know, living halfway across the world from family and really not having a support structure. She was really kind of my family for many years. She and her husband, actually, they both almost adopted me. They'd call me their spiritual daughter. <laughs> and so her husband, I mean, he, he passed away a few years ago, but he definitely called me his spiritual daughter. You know, he would sort of give me advice and they were always there for me, you know, what pretty much like family. And I still remember actually, you know, going for my first job interview when I was a postdoc, you know, I was in San Diego, UC San Diego at the time. And the job interview was in Chicago at the Field Museum. And they were in St. Louis, of course, both Gillian and, and Bob. And I made a special request to stop off in St. Louis for one night before going to Chicago, because I was nervous and this was my first job interview. And it's comforting to me to, you know, spend at least one night with them because they were, you know, they were the closest to family that I had in the U.S. So she was an incredible mentor and always just gave me sort of unvarnished advice when she kind of felt it was needed. <laughs> and I think it made me a better scientist. But also, she, you know, she taught me how to be a good mentor my students as well I think so yeah any examples come to your mind then on your mentorship journey oh gosh you know I've been very lucky to have some incredible students and postdocs that have come through my lab let's see so there was a student from India who joined my lab and I actually met her in India when I was visiting I was actually uh, in Ahmedabad in 2016 for one of these Fulbright fellowships. I spent about six months. And so she 
had applied to ASU at the time and asked to sort of meet with me. And I met with her there and felt like she had a lot of potential. I saw a little bit of myself in her, you know, just in her, how naive she was about what <laughs> what it really meant to move halfway across the world and go to graduate school. But she was also very determined. It's difficult knowing at that stage, you know, whether they're going to succeed necessarily or not. But I kind of had a gut feeling about her. And I accepted her as a student. Her first year was very difficult. She missed her parents and she missed her family. And she was miserable. I remember having a very tough meeting with her where she came to me and she was almost in tears and saying, you know, how much she missed her family. And also just that her family had all these expectations from her and that she was not meeting those expectations by being here, you know, in the U.S. And I just felt really sad that, you know, she felt so kind of agitated because of all the kind of weight of expectations on her. I tried to counsel her, you know, as best I could, knowing that, you know, my own family had been very much more supportive. And so I I was lucky from that perspective. I know from having many friends sort of in a similar situation in India where, you know, they would be like, oh, you need to get married or you need to be at home. She had all of that, the weight of all of that. And I had to talk to her to try to sort of not tell her that what she was feeling was not valid, I think, you know, or to sort of trivialize it in any way, because I could sense how disturbed she was feeling by this whole thing. And and I just counseled her then to not rush into any decisions, right? I said, you, you know, you've got your life ahead of you. And there's, I see a lot of potential in your motivation and in your intelligence and your abilities. And I think you can do great things. I would try not to push her into making any kind of decision, right? I wasn't going to tell her to do this or do that, but I would just tell her, you know, be patient with yourself and, you know, just don't rush into making any decisions that are going to have lasting impact on your life. And so she decided to stay and she's, I would say, one of my better students. She did incredible work. She's actually working at uh, NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center now. So she yeah, she's doing great. That's a beautiful success story. And it just feels so fulfilling, right? Yeah, she's, she's doing very well. Let's backtrack a little bit. You know, I'm just sort of thinking from the perspective of a young girl who might be as bold as you are, as aspirational as you are. How do you think your classmates in school or your teachers in school will describe you? Like, you know, now when they see you and say, <laughs> oh, is, <laughs> is this the same Minakshi? <laughs> I don't know if I stood out in any way, really. I mean, in school, I mean, I was just one of the regular kids and I wasn't a particularly kind of brilliant, I would say brilliant student. I mean, I certainly didn't do badly. I always studied at the very last minute (laughs) and passed the exams by studying all night. I would actually be very curious to sort of ask if I were to see them again, ask them, you know, well, what was your impression of me? I had a core group of friends and relatively quiet. I I don't think I was sort of a big, big personality or something like that. (laughs) No, I really appreciate your, you know, honesty and vulnerability because that's what makes it possible and normal for any young girl who's sort of aspiring to be a planetary scientist or, you know, (laughs) thinking of sending a mission to Mars or a mission to Antarctica and so on and so forth. So, Minakshi, if I had to ask you to describe one day in the life of Minakshi. Wow. Okay. You know, that's the funnest thing about my job is that no two days are the same. (laughs) So this semester, for example, I am teaching a course. And so, you know, I definitely have sort of regular hours when I, when I teach my class, but at the same time, every single day is different. So today, for example, I had the U S ambassador from India who was visiting us at ASU. And so Ambassador Sandhu was there for an hour or so. And so we showed him around my school and gave him a little bit of information about the kinds of programs and research that our faculty and our students are involved in and things like that. But I don't do that every day. And then, you know, there's the usual thing is, of course, that, you know, there are lots of meetings that you have to be part of. A lot of the mission work, actually, at the current stage in the Mars Sample Return Program, a lot of that involves 
thinking through various aspects of the mission, but a, much of that sort of discussion happens in group meetings and, and things where you discuss various things. So an important part of my job is, is talking to my faculty, talking to students, talking to my colleagues, talking to people at the Jet Propulsion Lab where I work as you know principal scientist. So I mean, so there's definitely a lot of kind of engaging with other people. Yeah, different stakeholders. Yeah. So this this sort of drives me to double click on how would you describe your leadership style? Like how would you describe Akshi as the leader? That's an interesting question. I would say I seek to be. It's a work in progress, right? I mean, I feel that leadership is something that's that's more of a journey. You're not kind of born being a certain way. You learn things every single day and you bring that into your practice of, of being a leader. And my core sort of values that I bring to my leadership is a sense of courage, not backing away from, from things that might seem uncomfortable, right? I very much sort of believe in being courageous about things. I feel that I have a lot of resilience. I think difficult situations don't daunt me. I don't sort of back off from that. I try to be empathetic, especially in, in these kinds of roles. You know, you have to sometimes you may have to make a tough decision about perhaps letting some people go because the financial situation may not allow it. But doing it in a way that sort of, you know, I think it's important to really understand the impact of your actions. And so I think empathy is really important to me. And I, I, I try very hard to sort of bring that into my leadership. You have to constantly learn and grow <laughs> to sort of become more of what you want to try to be as a leader. Uh, Manakshi, what does success mean to you? No, I think, you know, success, to me, I think it's having a positive impact on those around you. And it can be one person or it can be thousands. I mean, especially after the accident, I had to really think about what kind of impact I was having in my work. I was obviously doing my research and growing the sort of store of knowledge but was I happy doing just that? I kind of realized that no, you know, that was not what was the most important to me. I think asking and answering questions, I love doing that, but I think that I wanted to do more than just that. In that process, I wanted to bring other people along to so sort of join in that kind of quest and to give opportunities. I mean, I feel lucky to have had the opportunities that I've had but I was at the right time at the right place in many cases. One of the things that you definitely realize when you are in this kind of role, I mean, that talent is not inequitably distributed. I think it's opportunity that is, right? So there's a lot of talent. There's a lot of really, you know, smart kids that are out there, but the opportunity to really kind of succeed in what they want to do, that does not exist for anyone and everyone, right? For me, success me now me, I think again, it's an evolving definition for yourself in terms of what you what what you feel you you can do. But to me, it means having an impact beyond just something that affects my own life. That's a very powerful perspective. So on a lighter note, how does it feel to be married to an astronaut? <laughs> and that also an astronaut from a different yeah. culture. <laughs> yeah, no, you know what? We've always so Scott and I, we've always sort of been amazed at the fact that, yes, we grew up in very different cultures, but in so many sort of ways that really matter at the core of who we are, we're very similar, actually. He loves adventure. He loves exploring. That's really something that kind of drives me as well. I, I love that. He and I enjoy doing the same kinds of things. And we, many times we kind of think very similarly about problems and, and about how to solve them. <laughs> and and uh, we have an amazingly similar taste in food. <laughs> you know, it's, just, it's kind of uncanny. So it's amazing how much in common we have, despite having obviously grown up in very, very different cultures. But yeah, I mean, he's he's had an incredibly amazing 
you know, life in terms of his own childhood experiences. He grew up all over the world, really. I mean, his dad was in with the Boeing airplane company. And so they traveled to a lot of different places. He grew up in uh, Senegal and in uh, Beirut and Athens, Greece. Yeah, he, he traveled a lot when he was a kid, learned to speak different languages and, you know, ended up going to medical school and becoming an astronaut relatively soon after he he was in his residency, actually, when he was selected. You know, he was with NASA for 17 years, uh, flew on five shuttle flights. And he's a mountaineer. He's climbed Mount Everest. And so yeah, he, he's, he's done some pretty crazy things. Gone inside of an active volcano, you know. <laughs> but yeah, but I, I love that about him, that, you know, he's very he's very curious as well and very inquisitive about the world around him and we think a lot alike which is the craziest adventure you both have done together oh gosh let's see so you know what we we got engaged in antarctica wow <laughs> and it was a total coincidence because we didn't go together you know i went down there so this was in 2012 I had been down there to collect meteorites along with uh, you know, a team of U.S. Uh, scientists uh, with the Antarctic Search for Meteorites program. It's a NASA and NSF-funded program. And Scott, at the time, was the chief medical officer for the Antarctic program. So he actually had just taken that job, and he was just visiting the different kind of U.S. posts to sort of uh, check out what their medical facilities were. And, you know, if you know anything about the Antarctic program, I mean, basically you cannot predict when the flights are gonna take place necessarily. I, w- I had been out in the field for two months and camping in, in the field. And he was actually in McMurdo at the time when we were taken out of the field. That date could have changed, you know, when I was coming out of the field, because of weather, it could have shifted by a week, it could have shifted by 10 days or whatever it was. But I came back and he happened to be in McMurdo at the same time. (laughs) And he was supposed to actually leave for another field camp like two days later. And so his flights could have been sort of on a different date or time or whatever, but we overlapped literally 48 hours in McMurdo. He brought along with him this little Tiffany's box that had the ring. (laughs) How sweet and special. (laughs) He'd hope, you know, he didn't know if he was going to see me. But yeah, he basically asked me to marry him near Scott's hut in McMurdo. (laughs) So I would would have to say that was probably our our craziest adventure together. But we've had some pretty amazing trips together. That is such a beautiful story. While I would love to another story, but I have to double click on one more story, which is probably even more close to my heart because I've done scuba diving myself, but I can never imagine doing a shipwreck of the Titanic. So <laughs> that was another epic adventure. <laughs> How did you guys have the courage to do that? Like, what's your vibe? Gosh, I mean, so that's something, you know, to go to the Titanic. You know, it's at about 12,500 feet depth. And at such depth, I mean, the kinds of creatures that you see in the ocean at those depths, I mean, it's an amazing thing, right? And the curiosity is what drove us, I think. I mean, and and Scott has always wants to go down to the deepest point in the ocean, Mariana's Trench. He wants to do that at some time. I don't know if I would want to do that necessarily, but he does. I was definitely curious about seeing the Titanic and, you know, had this opportunity to be in this unique, actually, it's an experimental submarine as well. So that made, <laughs> made it a little bit, bit trickier, but it's um, uh, it was a five-person submersible and it took us about two and a half hours to go all the way down to the bottom. You know, we spent about an hour and a half, two hours down, down at the bottom, just sort of looking at some of the debris from the Titanic and we saw some fish and other sea creatures and it was it was amazing yeah and then it took us another two and a half hours to come back up but yeah this has been really fascinating Manakshi. like to understand you not just as a planetary scientist but as a person and 
you make such a non-traditional profession seem so doable and that's what i'm finding <laughs> the best part of this conversation <laughs> i sure hope so i mean i i think you know there's there's so much exciting stuff happening in this area and uh, you know there's there's lots of opportunities for for people to to get involved yeah and you know on this note uh, like i told you earlier and thank you so much for walking this journey with me that i started atlanta diaries because i just thought that this is a great place where people can learn and unlearn their definition of success so any parting thoughts for the younger generation as they find their own greatness wow so i mean i think the main thing that i would just say is that you know listen to your inner voice what it tells you about what you feel is important to you right i mean i think ultimately that's what that's what life is about is to to find out what you are passionate about and it can be anything you know you don't have to believe what society tells you is important you can follow your own instincts about that so yeah that's such an honest perspective and i think that's what everyone needs to hear right so create your own rule book then you'll enjoy what you're doing yeah right thank you very much vinakshi thank you yeah it was great talking to you uh and man well, hopefully we get to see each other in houston sometime thank you very much for listening all my guests have brought their most vulnerable selves on atlanta diaries and even if a small segment of these conversations can help champion the journey of one person it's going to be really worth it i do have a request for you Please share this podcast on your social media and with your family and friends. Our society is constantly evolving and Atlanta Diaries must too. I really appreciate if you can leave your feedback in the form of a review or a rating. These are impactful and rousing stories that need to be shared far and wide. See you next time for another one on Atlanta Diaries.